1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20 says this. This commandment I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping the faith and a good conscience. And then Paul, talking to his son in the faith, someone who he's mentored through a ministry and mentored through uh, his Christianity, uh, sets a- opposed to his, his wishes and hopes for Timothy, some who have done just the opposite of that. Instead of fighting the good fight, instead of keeping the faith, instead of keeping a good conscience, he goes on to say, "...which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith." Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. In the church at Corinth, we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's a, a man there who has married or taken his father's wife, and, and they recognize Paul emphasizes to them that that's not okay, that that's sinful, that that's wrong. And he uses the same phrase that he talks about Hymenaeus and Alexander, about that man, that he has handed him over to Satan. What does that mean? What is, what is Paul trying to communicate to him? We know that the purpose of it is, is so that, that these people who have been handed over to Satan will recognize the error of their way and come back. But Paul is telling specifically the the Corinthian church that they haven't followed what he is following that Jesus told all of us to follow in Matthew chapter 18. If a brother sins, you go and show him his fault. If he listens to you, you've you've won your brother. If he doesn't listen to him, you take some others with you and you try and win him again. You show him his fault again. If he he listens to you, you've won your brother. If he doesn't listen to you then, then you take it to the church. And if he won't even listen to the church, then you treat him as a Gentile. You treat him as... A tax collector. So Jesus in Matthew chapter 18 teaches us that sin in the church is not okay. Paul tells Timothy to tell these two Christians in Ephesus that have rejected the faith, that have rejected a good conscience, that are no longer keeping the faith, fighting the good fight. He tells them, he, Paul tells Timothy to make sure they know that sin is not okay in the church. Paul tells the Corinthian church to tell this man that they haven't told, they have a problem at Corinth, they they know this man is living in sin and they've done nothing about it. So Paul is not only upset with the man who's in sin, he's upset with the church because they haven't done what Jesus commanded the church to do. To make sure people know that sin in the church, in the life of a Christian, is not okay. So what's the punishment? What's the punishment for these people? What's the punishment that Jesus describes in Matthew 18 that we read about in 1 Timothy, that we read about in 1 Corinthians, that they're handed over to Satan? What does that mean? Well, what it means is that they were to know that they, while they were living in their sin, were not welcome in the church. Were not welcome at church gatherings were not welcome to consider themselves faithful Christians. That if we had someone here today who was living in sin and and we went to them and we showed them that sin and they were unrepentant and we took others with us and showed them their sin again and they were unrepentant and it came before the church, came before the elders and the elders would would make the decision to, to, to discipline them and to say, you are no longer welcome. We no longer recognize you as a Christian because you're not living a faithful life. That if they came here, it would have to be clear to them that while perhaps they could visit with us, they would not be considered a faithful Christian or a member of this congregation until they repent of that sin. So so what, what does that look like? That looks like us telling folks, Paul telling Timothy to tell Hymenaeus and Alexander... Paul telling the Corinthian church to tell this man who's living in sin, you're not welcome here. You're not welcome at our assemblies. You're not welcome to be a a part of us because you're living in sin, and sin within the church in the life of a Christian is not okay. How many people today choose that punishment on their own? Again, what's the punishment? 
the punishment in essence is you can't come and be with us at our gatherings. And God, through Paul, equates that to be handed over to Satan. You're not welcome to be here with us because you're not one of us, and until you repent of one of these things because you know better, you're not welcome here. And he equates that to being handed over to Satan, but how many today in the world and even in the church choose that punishment freely? Uh, you, you may have heard this, and I believe it's still the case. I know it was a couple of years ago. The, the, the largest growing religious group in, in America today are, are the nuns. Those who don't claim any specific Christianity or any specific denominational group, they're just, they're just spiritual people. And they don't come to church services because they say, well, the church gets in the way of, of my relationship with God. And they're choosing to not be a part of the church because of things that they see as inconsistencies. And maybe that's true and, and, and maybe that's not. But, but the world does that. But brothers and sisters, how many of us do that? I've struggled with this lesson a little bit. Uh, this lesson, like many lessons, if, if you will examine yourself during this lesson, if you can say to yourself, I'm doing all right, then you're not the main target of this lesson, and I don't want you to feel guilty. That's not my point. That's not my, game, my goal. That's not my aim. But if you examine yourself and you say, well, maybe I could think about some things, then I want you to think about some things. I want you to consider some things. I think it's significant that, that Paul tells these, these unfaithful people, sin is not okay, I'm handing you over to Satan. You need to know, unfaithful Christian, that you aren't welcome in our assemblies until you repent of this sin because we can't be mixed up with people who claim to be Christians but are living in sin. And their punishment is not to be at church services. But then we today... So many of us sometimes choose to not be at church services. Again, if you're part of the group that you can't make it all the time, you legitimately, absolutely cannot make it all the time, then you're not the main group that I'm trying to talk to. But most of us don't fall into that category. The vast majority of us don't fall into that category. Most of us could be here every time the doors are open. I want us to think about this morning, why are we here? Why do we gather? Why do we come together? Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. You're familiar with this passage. You, you know this passage. But when we think about uh, ch the church getting together, church gatherings, Hebrews chapter 10 is, is, is maybe the, the best passage to, to talk about that and talk about the importance uh, of our coming together. Hebrews chapter 10, let's read verses 19 through 25. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Why do we come together? Well, well we can see in the book of Acts that we, we come together on the first day of the week to worship. We're commanded. We see example after example after example of this is what the New, church, the, the New Testament church did. This is what Christians do. They, they come together primarily to worship God. But is there any other reason why we come together? Is there any other reason why we assemble as the church, not just on Sundays, but any other time that we, we come together? Why do we come together? Hebrews chapter 10, let's read 19 through 25. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. You remember that, right? We just partook of the blood of Jesus, right? We just remembered it at the very least. We, we, we remember the blood of Jesus that was said on the cross. We have confidence to enter the holy place, to come before the presence of God because of the blood of Jesus. Because of that, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, what should we do? Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. Because we have this hope, because we have this faithful high priest, let's hold fast to the confession that we have, verse 24, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Let's think about, let, let me think about, let you think about how we can help one another to love and good deeds. Verse 25, not forsaking, not forgetting about, 
not thinking, well, that's really not that important. Not considering, ah, well, you know, I don't, I don't really have to be with the church or be a part of the church to be a Christian. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In the first century, when the book of Hebrews was written, there were those who had forsaken the assembly. It was the habit of some. Today, in the 21st century, it is the habit of some to forsake the assembly. What's the purpose of our coming together? Certainly, on the first day of the week, we're commanded to come together to worship God. We're commanded to sing praises to God, to, to glorify His name, to encourage one another, to teach and admonish one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. We're commanded to, uh, we see the examples of the Word being presented to us. We're commanded to uh, commemorate the Lord's death until He comes. We're commanded to give back on the first day of the week. We're, we're commanded to do all of these things. And yes, that is why we do those things. But is that the only reason the church assembles. Not according to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, there's, there's much more to it. We encourage one another. We, we lift one another up. We spur one another on to love and good deeds. We, we do all of these things to, to help us live this Christian life that we're all trying to live. We encourage us to hold fast to love and good deeds. Read verses 26 and 27. For if we go on sinning willfully... After receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries. Why do we come together? To keep us from sin and the terror of God's judgment. Why, why do we come together? Is it just to worship? No, no, part of it is that encouragement. Part of it is that spurring one another on to love and good deeds. Part of it is to, to check on one another. Part of it is to make sure, hey, are you struggling? Uh, can I help you? Can I be here for you? Can, can we have a relationship where, where you, can, you can admit that you've got struggles and I can pray for you and I can be there for you and, and we can make sure that we don't continue on in this sin because if we continue on in this sin, there only remains a terrifying expectation of the judgment to come. What does that mean? An expectation of the judgment to come. That means that we as Christians, when we go on sinning willfully, at least in the back of our minds, what do we know? When judgment day comes, it's going to be terrifying because I know the right thing to do and I'm not doing it. I know how I should live my life and I'm not doing it. So we come together to avoid that. We come together to encourage one another, to spur one another on, to, to correct one another when necessary. To love each other and to be there for one another. You see, the first century Christians, they needed this. They needed this. They needed Sundays. They needed any and every other time that they, they got together because they were living a life of sacrifice. They were living a life of, of, of difficulty, of persecution, of, of punishment because of their faith. Turn over to, to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Let's read verses 14 through 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. So, so there, there's two main points for, for this lesson, two things that I want you to consider. Uh, first of all, this, this is a lesson about attendance at the assembly of the church. And I don't just mean Sundays and Wednesdays. This is a lesson that I want to encourage you on, to challenge you. I want to spur you on. Uh, to, to be here more often, if you can be. If you can't be, if you can't be, don't feel guilty because you can't be. But if you can be, I want to challenge you. I want to spur you on. I want to encourage you to be here more often. And, and the second part of the lesson is, is for those of us who, who maybe are here all the time. Uh, is for us to, to really think about what kind of lives we're living and, and based on the kind of lives we're living, and again, examine yourself. You know what kind of life you're living more than I do. God knows better for all of us. But, but what's the purpose of us coming together? Sometimes it could be, and not just for us, but for people in general who are religious or people who, who have regular activities that they're a part of, sometimes it, we just have to avoid it becoming checking off a box. It can't be that. 
And let, let's look at the scripture and, and see some reasons why it can't be that way. Ephesians chapter 3, again, let's read verses 14 through 21. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant to you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, and that you may be filled up to the all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Did, did you hear that? Did you listen to those words? Did you know he's talking about you? Paul is, is talking about Christians, and he wants us to be filled up to the fullness of God. He wants us to have the power of God working within us. Look again at verse 16 and verse 20. Just, just those two verses. There's, there's powerful verses here, but just listen to these. That he, God, would, would grant to you according to the riches of his glory... To be strengthened with the power, with power through His Spirit in the inner man. Power. God wants you to have power. Verse 20. Now to Him, God, who is able to do far more about, beyond all that we ask or think. God can do anything. God can do more than what we ask or think. Where is that power working? What's the end of the verse say? According to the power that is at work within us. Sometimes I... I think maybe I, maybe we get a little intimidated by that. God wants to use me. God wants to, to use me to, to do things. God wants me to, uh, to, to be his instrument of, of bringing about his will. Again, I've shared this with you before. I, I don't know why God chose you. I don't know why God chose me. I don't know why God chose sinful man, weak man, weak people to be his tools on this earth today. But I know that he did because the Bible tells me so. And God has given you the power to make a difference in the world that you live in, and He expects you to do that. But when we read those verses in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, can you name someone who, who lives their life daily, displaying, exhibiting that kind of power, that kind of grace, that kind of mercy, that kind of love, that kind of service to, excuse me, to others? I can say that I hope that I do that every now and then, but I don't do that regularly. I don't live the, the type of life that, that God would, would have me to live to, 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 to be really who God would want me to be as, as often as I should. This, is, this here is talking about having the, the kind of faith that you have so much faith in God that you don't know what is not possible. That with God all things are possible. That the power of God in the gospel, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, working in your life can make a difference in anybody's life. And make, can make a difference in everybody's life. The church needs ministers, elders, deacons, Bible class teachers, each and every single member, each and every single brick that's a part of the temple, each and every single body part that's a part of the body of Christ to live lives worthy of this calling, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. Those who would boldly go out and tell people about Jesus, Matthew chapter 28. Those who would stand firm against the schemes of the devil, Ephesians chapter 6. And those who would willingly suffer for the name of Christ, 1 Peter chapter 4. Did you notice the name of the sermon this morning? Did you look in the bulletin? Did you look on uh, when you got the, the email earlier this week? It's a weird name. Is the church a zoo? What? That's a weird name, isn't it? Is the church a zoo? Let me, let me share this with you. Has the church become a zoo? Full of what should be boldly powerful new creatures in Christ who instead now struggle in the wild of the world because of the comfort of captivity. Have you seen the movie Madagascar? 
It's a cartoon. It's a kid's movie. It's a, it's, a, it's a simple movie. So some of you may not have seen it if that's not your thing or if you don't have kids. But a lot of us probably have seen the movie Madagascar. I'll give you a quick rundown. Uh, again, it's, it's an animated movie, but it's about uh, some, some animals in a zoo. I think it's in New York, and, and, and the, the main character is Leo, Leo the lion. And he comes out uh, at a certain time every day, and he climbs up on his, his perch there that they've made him in the zoo, and he, he roars. And what do the crowds do? They cheer for him. And they say, wow, what the, the power of a lion. And sometimes they, they feed him and, and they, they, they get to see this, this lion uh, tear up a, a chunk of meat. Uh, and, and they see this, but then in the movie what happens is somehow, I don't even remember exactly how it is, but they get stuck in a, they, they sneak out of the zoo and they get taken all the way to, to Madagascar. They get taken out to the wilderness. And these animals that were born in captivity, that were raised in captivity, that have lived in captivity their whole life are now in the wild. And guess what? They don't have a clue. I'm not suggesting that Charlotte Avenue is a zoo where what should be boldly powerful Christians no longer know how to live in the world because we've gotten used to the comfort of captivity. But I am warning us against it. I do want you to, to think about that. To think about the type of life that we live and what it looks like. It's interesting, it's entertaining to, to watch a lion at, at feeding time at a zoo. To see the, the powerful jaws and the sharp teeth rip a piece of meat to, to shreds. But, but that pales in comparison to watching a lion on the prowl in the middle of the savannah, doesn't it? We can tell the difference there, right? Those are two different things. You, you've been to a zoo, right? You know, the, the zoo in Columbia, Riverbank Zoo, it's only about an hour away from here. Most of us have probably been to either to that, that zoo or some other zoo at some point in our lives. You know, it, it's, a, it's a neat place to go. At the Riverbank Zoo, you can go down there, you can see elephants, huge elephants. You can even see them. They, they've got it set up where uh, they've got this part where they can, you can see them swim. Ever thought about that? Seeing an elephant swim? Some of you who've been there, you know what I'm talking about. They've got this deep pool and, and the elephants are, are swimming through it. And you can, you can see it because it's a glass pane in front of the water. How, how neat is that? You can see the, the tall giraffes and you can, you can feed the giraffes and see their, their long tongue sticking out. And, and, and you can say, oh, that's gross. I don't want to be touched by a, the, tongue of a, the tongue of a giraffe. You can see tigers and alligators and flamingos and lions. You can see all of these amazing creatures. You know, it, it's, a, it's a neat place to go. I've been there a few times. I, I enjoyed it. I was entertained. I'll probably go back again because my kids haven't been yet. But I don't need to go back to the zoo. I've been there. I've done that. I've seen it. I don't need it. If we come to the assemblies of the church to a worship service because we enjoy it, because it's entertaining, we'll probably be back again. But... If we need it because we're out in the wild of the world and we're struggling and we're discouraged or even if we're excited because we've had a good week living the kind of life that God would really want us to live and we want to share that with other people, then we'll never be able to get enough. You see the difference? I, I go to a zoo because it's entertaining. I go to a zoo because I enjoy it. But I don't need to go back there because I don't need the animals. If I come to service, if I come to, to any assembly of the church, like Hebrews 10, 25 tells me to not forsake the assemblies of the church, but I come because I enjoy it, I come because I'm entertained by it, then yeah, I might come back. But what if it becomes no longer enjoyable? What if it becomes no longer entertaining? Then I'm not going to come back. But if I am honestly trying to live the best Christian life that I can, Failing and succeeding and messing up and falling short and following Jesus and, and being frustrated and, and sometimes spending time with sinners and tax collectors and sometimes uh, being with people who are destitute and afflicted and ill-treated and trying to lift them up and help them. If I'm living that kind of life and the struggle that that is, then I'll need to be here. 
And it won't be a question of whether or not I want to be here or whether I get out of it or if I enjoy it or if I'm entertained. It'll be the fact that I need to be with you, brothers and sisters in Christ, who are doing the very same thing that I am in the presence of our holy and mighty God. It won't be a want. It'll be a need. Have you ever thought about, and if we're honest with ourselves, we all have at some point, when we think about our worship, I, you know, I, I really didn't get anything out of worship this morning. You know, uh, that sermon, that preacher, uh, he just didn't, he just wasn't speaking to me today. The song service, oh, I just, you know, they didn't lead my song. They didn't lead my favorite, so, you know, I just, I just didn't really get anything out of it. Turn your Bibles to, to Malachi. Malachi chapter 1. The Wednesday night class on, on uh, the book of Acts, I believe, that Ken taught uh, this, this past Wednesday night. He brought up this passage, and I want to share, with it, share it with you as well. Malachi chapter 1, we'll start in verse 13. God speaking to the Israelites here says, You also say, My, how tiresome it is. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what is taken by robbery and what is lame or sick so that you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? He says of the Israelites talking about their worship, talking about their sacrifices, that, that it's become burdensome to them. That it's become difficult for them. That it's just tiresome. I got to go to worship again. I, I got to go to Wednesday night Bible class. I got to do this. I, I got to assemble with the church I got to do these things. It's just too much. I just don't get anything out of it. Go back to verse 10 and notice what he says. God's still speaking here. Oh, that there was one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. For from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name, and a grain offering that is pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Here, here God talking to His chosen people says, Listen, if you're not going to worship me right, if you're not going to need this worship, if you're not going to need the fellowship of God's people, if you're not going to need this encouragement, this, this pick-me-up so that you can go out and, and keep on living that faithful life, then shut the doors. I'd rather you just shut the doors. If you're just going to come here because you think you have to be here, shut the doors. Sell the building. But if you need it, and when you come together, if you truly worship me because you know who I am and because you've been striving to live for me each and every single day, that's the kind of worship that God desires. What's the point of this lesson? Again, as I said, and as I've tried to, to enumerate a couple of times, if I, if I were to, to pull back the veil a little bit of preaching and speaking, this may be true in a lot of different speaking jobs or that sort of thing, that it's difficult to try and, and reach the group that you're talking to without offending the group that you're really not trying to talk to. Listen, if you can't be here, or if you can only be here on Sunday mornings, if, if you can only be here on Sunday mornings, then you can only be here on Sunday mornings. But if you can be here more often and you're choosing not to, why? There's benefit from being here. What's the point of this lesson? What I hope you do with this lesson? I hope, I hope if you're not coming more often, I hope you start coming more often. For those of us who are here all the time, though, there's a point for us too. It's not just about being here. It's about living the life that we're supposed to live, not being this, this place where we come together and, and where we, we, we like, the, like Leo the lion, we, we roar and say, what a great Christian I am. I'm at services on Sundays and Wednesdays and Sunday nights, and I'm at all these other events. Look at how awesome I am. But instead, we come here because we desperately need the fellowship of God and our brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can walk out of these doors and live the kind of life that we want to. I'm guilty of not doing that as often as I should. How about you? What's the point of the lesson? Church gatherings, worship, Bible class, fellowship meals, service opportunities, any assembly of the church, 
will not be a priority to us if God isn't a priority in our lives. But if He is, each and every one of them will matter to us, not because of the entertainment value, not because we feel like we can check off a box, but because we're living a life in which we desperately need the fellowship of the church and the presence of God. I was asked to preach a sermon on attendance, and I was asked uh, to point out the positive things about why we need to be here. I don't know that I did that today. I apologize if that's what you needed. There's benefit from being here if we're being who we need to be out there. But if we're not being who we need to be out there, there may be very little benefit for us to be here. God might say, shut the doors. My challenge, my encouragement for you is if, if you can come more often, come more often. And if you're here all the time, or if you're not, live the life out there, will make you, which will make you hunger for being here. And if we do that, we won't need sermons like this because we'll earnestly desire that fellowship that you and I have with God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian this morning, that's how it happens. The blood of Jesus Christ can wash away all of your sins. If you believe that Jesus Christ is a resurrected Son of God, you're willing to confess that with your mouth, show that with your actions through repentance, and submit to baptism where Jesus' blood washes away all of your sins, and you can become a Christian right here and right now, and you can have the hope of heaven where one day we will spend every moment of eternity together. We won't have to worry about driving or distances or things getting in the way. We'll be in the presence of God eternally. And if you, like me, are a Christian who could honestly and would have to honestly say to myself, I can do better, then let's do better. If you have a need, if you need prayers, if you want to come forward and sit on one of these pews, we'll talk to you. If you have questions, if you have desires about learning more about God, please let us know those things. We would invite you to come and sit, sit up here and let us know those things right now as we stand and sing. Who will follow Jesus?